<laughs> so we will start the meeting. Just to inform everyone, uh, three of us have a an event, a municipal yes. event. Hi, Sarah. Happy birthday. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> just, we just sang <laughs> happy birthday. You missed the song, sorry. Damn it. <laughs> Again, I want to be on tune this time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call the meeting to order. All members present. Um, consideration of the Public Works Committee minutes. Any comments or suggestions? Move to accept. Okay, it's been moved to accept the minutes. I'm gonna second that. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Any public comments? Anybody have anything special to say that's not on our agenda? Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And um, what I'm going to do is move item 4D, uh, 4E, uh, up to the uh, front. This, this is the, uh, the request of the St. Croix Rowing Club to enter into a three-year lease. Do right, you ha have something you folks would like to say? Well, I'm sure I don't. Come up. To, yeah. Please come up. To. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, it is. Yeah. Hi, Shirley Dro. I'm with the St. Croix Rowing Club, and we just wanted to introduce ourselves. I live here in Hudson, um, and we want to uh, uh, thank you for allowing us to rent the pole shed, the old Luke Oil Building, for the last almost 20 years, um, and we hope to continue and um, hope to be a part of any development that happens on the riverfront too. So, yeah, thank you much. Right. Do you have any plans for maintenance, additions, changes to the shed, or have you done just about everything that can be done? Well, we have out, we are at our maximum capacity. We have the annex, which is that little piece in between um, the other building um, that's full as well. So, I guess our next step would be to find a way that we could um, house more boats, more equipment, and that would be in collaboration with the Parks Department or, the, or you know, city planning. Uh, we want to be as close to the waterfront as we can because right now we're at a distance where if you've seen our boats, it's kind of difficult for some of our members to walk that far with them, not because they're heavy, but they're big and they're long. And for some it might be a little bit heavy, but um, so we just want to stay very close to the river and also a concern for us would be the um, uh, water level. Um, the boats aren't very deep, but if it's very dry, we have to walk way out into the river and if it's too high, then the slope becomes um, kind of problematic as well. So those are our considerations. We need to be close and somewhere where there's kind of um, level water height, so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Yeah, and just to point out uh, a word of, you know, clarification in the, in the lease agreement, uh, per the recommendation of the uh, city administrator, Aaron Reeves, uh, in the old lease agreement, there was an <coughs> automatic renewal um, language in the previous lease agreement that he would requested being struck out of this one. So that after three year, after three years comes up and the lease expires, the rowing club would have to come back to a committee for renewal of a contract instead of just automatically being done. So he's he's recommending striking a lot of that verbiage out of a lot mm -hmm. of our leases. So that's pretty much the only thing that was that was changed from the previous lease agreement. That in the dates we've never had to implement it. No, ever, so it's mm -hmm. always you've always come every three years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I imagine what all the projects the city has going on anyway with the riverfront. Yeah. Yeah, it's just from a logis logistical <clears throat> standpoint, like you said, there we have a lot of 
many agreements with a lot of different organizations and if somehow one slips through the cracks and all of a sudden it's automatically renewed and no board or committee knew about it and we had plans for a different direction for a facility or something like that and now you know we have to pursue termination of lease so i just making yeah. all lease agreements have to come back to a certain committee so thank you mike yep. So, a discussion of possible action on the request for the St. Croix Rowing Club to enter into a three-year lease for 6 St. Croix Street. Are you either you are you familiar with the, yep. the buildings up there? I would motion to approve the three-year lease agreement with St. Croix Rowing Club. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yes, I'll second that. All right. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. No, Sorry. We're not trying to make you leave, but we just want to <laughs> <laughs> allow you to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For Thanks coming. for coming. Next item unfinished bus business. A discussion and possible action on the urban forestry tree ordinance chapter 229 updates mike did you want to yeah. summarize that yeah i'll just summarize it so at the previous meeting um we did have some discussion and i did make those changes uh specifically uh under 229-10 intent and purpose uh, jim you had made the comment um in the previous draft it had the city of Hudson would regulate finance control planting removal maintenance protection of trees and shrubs upon private and public areas in the city so I struck the private language out of there and just moved it down um, to you know eliminate guard against dangerous conditions which may result in injury to persons or property both in public and private areas within the city without without specifically saying that the city is going to finance private trees so great remove that Good. Um, and then other comments were with abatement from uh, mr doug rowan's comments um i did include back in the public nu nuisance declaration um the language that says uh, if the tree is infested with injurious insects or pests is injurious to public improvements is dead or cannot substantially support foliage obstructs free passage of pedestrians or vehicles or endangers the life so i added that um, free passage back into this ordinance which was stated in the previous one so i added that language back in um, and then if you go down uh, under 229-14 uh, 3b talking about abatement uh, we had discussion on how long we should give property owners the chance to remove said abated tree that has been declared a public nuisance and i know we said that you know 30 days probably isn't realistic knowing that the schedules of a lot of the tree companies in the city and around the city that work in the city um, are booked out you know four or five six weeks sometimes um and with the onset of eab it's just going to become a lot busier here so we talked about having the property owner at least have the tree scheduled for removal mm. and that would that would qualify as enough of a um, what do you want to say that would qualify to show that they're they're proceeding with removing of that said tree does that make sense mm -hmm. okay and that's 15 days, right? Yeah, okay. yep. 15B. Yep. Is that clear then on the notice that we give to the resident? Yep. Yep. That if it's a tree removal, they have? They have 15 days to have the removal scheduled, scheduled. and then they will have to, okay. it says, you know. That, that I yep. think if I recall when we changed that last, I think that was two summers ago, actually. Yep that um, tree removal wasn't really pointed out in that letter that went out to them. Sure. Because we didn't have, you know, it was more of trimming hedges and things like that at that time. Okay, for the, for the, SO, for the policy that we developed? Yes. Off the double. But for the letter that actually, I'm talking about the letter that goes to the resident yeah. that n would need to be edited again, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We'll make those edits. Okay. You mark that down, Deb, in the minutes. Mm -hmm. Can you send me a copy of that after you're done with that one? Mm -hmm. That'd be yep. great. Thank yep. you. Yep. 
And then, Mike, the other question I had is under 229.20 with removal. Yep. Uh, the, the part about the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway Zone. Yes. So is that basically just kind of like environmental standards that because it's <coughs> close to the scenic river, or it's in the scenic river zone? Yep. So we spoke about this at Urban Forestry last night. So NR 115 is with the Willow River Riverway. NR 118 is with the St. Croix Scenic Riverway. And the state has its own guidelines for uh, tree removal, tree replacement, bank stabilization, okay. so on and so forth. So just to add in some language into our ordinance that if you know, a property owner is contacting the city to remove a tree that they're having to follow those standards okay. um, that are outlined, you know, that are outlined in, in R-118. Okay. So I appreciate that. Um, on this, we really listened to, I forget the resident that was here at the last meeting, mm -hmm. or the last two, I think. Yep. So I appreciate some of the rewrites and kind of um, being a little more thoughtful and intentional in some of these pieces. So I yep. think that's helpful. Good. Thank you. So we, are you looking for a motion, Mr. Chair? Yes. Yeah, I would motion to um, approve. Second. Okay, for for discussion, um, have this has this been re reviewed by the attorney, or does it need to be? It will be reviewed by the attorney. Yes. Okay. So prior, if it, if it, it's approved tonight, I will pass this along to the attorney for review, uh, prior to bringing it to council. Great. Um, and then we'll go Perfect. through the process of updating ordinance through through the council. All right. Any other discussion? Um, for that removal section, is that removal specifically regarding public trees? Again, it doesn't. I was just reading through that. And I'm like, hmm, is that public or private? So it doesn't specify, right? Right. Um, I mean, does the city want to get into a situation where they're requiring? Private, I mean, it's one thing to have a tree that's identified as a nuisance tree to be removed, right? I mean, that's, that's a no brainer. So the trees that are- But here we're not talking about nuisance trees anymore. I, I think we're just talking about So 20, yep. um, let's take a check. 229 18 says public trees and shrubs. Um, then 229, oh, is there a numbering? I think there's a numbering oh, problem. 18, so there's two 18s. So planting has to be, uh, that 19. should change to 19. Yeah, to 19. Uh huh. And so, um, maybe. If this has to do with planting on public, since we have to make a couple edits here, yep. maybe you could say 229-19 uh, planting of public trees yep. or trees on public land. I just want to be really clear because when you're reading these, each section should be clear about that it's public trees that we're talking about. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so if <laughs> removal... is just about public trees. Right. Or is that, the reason I'm asking is that um, at Park Board last, was that just yesterday? At, uh, not Park Board, I'm sorry. Um, Urban Hudson Forestry. Urban Forestry Board meeting yesterday, it was explained to us that in our uh, the state Wisconsin legislator chapter NR 118 for the land that we're talking about goes from all the way from the river up to basically the um, western edge of First Street. Hmm. So it's a little different than the other uh, Wisconsin statute that covers the Willow River. Um, so this one goes much further back. So basically everyone who, you know, has homes there are subject to this that would include private trees as well. So I want to just be very clear for 229 what will be the new 229 
Section 21, removal. Yep. We're talking about removal of public trees or private trees because there's both in that section of land that pertains <clears throat> to the NR 118. Does that make sense? Or yeah. just needs a little bit of clarification, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if I read this removal, you know, the 229, 21, 1, any person or firm engaged in the removal of any public tree or shrub shall have the necessary limits. So in number, in, under item one, it specifically states public, public. tree. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I would say that these removals would be strictly public, public trees. trees. Mike, uh, in the example, or just the theoretical example of like uh, if a private tree was heaving a sidewalk mm -hmm. or something like that, I would think that we would want to require a private entity to remove or remove part or all of a tree that's heaving a public s sidewalk. Would that be included under this removal section as well? I'm just thinking of ways that it could include private mm -hmm. trees in this section so I'd want some way to be able to you know make sure that we're taking care of <laughs> our citizen safety if it's a problem even if it's a private tree as well if, if, isn't that covered under 229 14 where they on B where it says private premises so that's where the city would issue the written notice and <coughs> first one have the 15 days Are you saying that if it's, um, I mean, I'm reading if that. If it's lifting up a sidewalk, it would be a nuisance? Yeah. 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 And then the city would inform them and you'd have to, deal, <coughs> they'd have to deal with it. They'd have to hire or let us deal with it or something. Yeah. I think that's covered already. I can, you know, I can check with the consultant who drafted this ordinance to see what she's, what she's seen in her other ordinances that she's written or other communities in regards to that removal section, if it's strictly public or public private or, and just get some feedback. I, I think that her intention, her or his intention yeah. was that it had to do with public trees. Mm -hmm. But when we throw in there this reference to the National Scenic Riverway, that because is, we're, we're different. Hud yeah. Still, uh, Hudson is different than, you know, mm -hmm. interior town because of the Scenic Riverway. Yeah. So when we threw this in there, that's when my mind was like, Ugh, right. you know, what are the variables now? Because it's that applies to both private and public trees. The, the so sta maybe. Wisconsin state statute does. So it sounds, but like, our it sounds section, like we need to research that piece just yeah. a little bit. So maybe number four would be its own <clears throat> subsection. Can you define just that area? I would, Mike, I would suggest under where we already, 229.14. Yep where it says private premises and we give the 15, why don't we just write in there, has, must comply with um, okay. NR1, one, one, is it 115? Okay. okay. I would maybe just put it there so that you're covered. Mm. That's. But maybe that's also a question for Kathy. You know, we could. Mm -hmm. She could look at the language maybe too. Do I, think, I don't think it needs Kathy's time. I think it's just like a, a logic. Organizational. Uh, yeah, it's an organizational question. Right. Like you gotta think through the circumstances. I mean, and I could, it, I could and see. And we have to say what do we want. I mean, you, I, we could specify removals for private, removals for public, and then removals in scenic all pri both private and public removals in scenic riverway must comply with state con statutes yeah. i mean we uh, from my understanding as a river town we don't have to mm -hmm. force compliance because we make our own decisions mm -hmm. as a river town so I, I think it's a pretty important decision actually yeah. if we go back to the whole dock issue it was a yeah. pretty important issue then yeah it was. so i I want to be careful that we do it right the first time and not have to revisit. Okay. Yep. So it's it's a matter of what do we want as a city? Do we want to um, force 
people, including myself, who own property on First Street to have to comply with the state statue or not when they're dealing with their private trees. Mm -hmm. it's, it, well, I mean, it's, it's going to be a big deal for those people that live the two, three sections of my block. But shouldn't those people who live within this, and we can all, you know, we can maybe clarify what that actually is. I don't know if it's up to First Street or not. That was just Buck saying that's what he recalls. But to get an actual map of what the actual scenic riverway is. And how far it and goes. And how far off it goes. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think before this goes to council, we really need to answer that question. Because I don't want any conflict between our ordinances and state statutes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to flush that out. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. 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 I can bring it back next month if, if you deem that necessary. Yeah. And if you have questions about my questions, yeah. you know how to reach me. Yeah. I'd ra like I said, I'd rather <laughs> get it right the first time yeah. than yeah. have something by I'd, the Yeah. Part. Yeah. It's yeah. better yeah. at yeah. this. That piece could really be the cont controversial piece of the whole thing. Absolutely. So uh, we, need, we do need to get that right. Okay. Yeah. Because I want to plant a tree of the year in my backyard, but I need to remove one to do it. Do I have to? Yeah. What do I need to do? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I have a question, then others will likely have questions as well. Sure. Okay. So procedure, I think we need, I need to withdraw the motion. Yes. Is that correct? Until we get this um, ironed out. Sorry that, sounds, that sounds like a way to do that. That's, yeah. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> All right, well, you've, you've withdrawn your, are yeah. you withdrawing your motion? And uh, Mike will work on the, uh, yep. that particular piece. And, That's fine. And uh, I'm, I would ask that you converse with Sarah on that, too, to make sure she's, yeah. she's happy before we come to the next meeting. Right? <laughs> no. I I'll just keep trying. I'll keep I putting it on Once there. and right. It's my <laughs> policy. Do it once, do it right. Yeah. yeah. Motion carried. When you rescind it. I don't think we need a motion, do we? Just to say. You just recall it? Yeah. Okay. Withdraw <laughs> my motion. Yeah. Withdraw. So you withdraw don't have motion. to hit. Nope. Okay. Motion is drawn. Send it, it doesn't back happen to you. very often. <laughs> right. New business discussion of possible action of on stormwater pond maintenance procedures. All right. So, in your packet, there was. A, there should be a general pond maintenance procedure uh, draft and this came about because as you all know you know with Hudson being an MS4 community we need to perform uh, post construction maintenance on our ponds which includes um, you know some tree removal pond dredging bank stabilization seeding so on and so forth and um, when it comes to maintaining ponds people don't really understand what we're required to do through the state. And um, some people think that it's okay for a forest to grow in our stormwater pond facilities. And we have a lot of those in our city um, right now. So we're having to go in and clean them up and in order to make, communicate better with the public of what we're doing, what our intentions are and why we're doing it and schedule. Uh, Jim thought it would be a great idea to put together just some basic procedures of how we would go about doing that. So uh, if you go to that bottom bottom portion, the procedures is basically, you know, a staff will identify mm -hmm. annual maintenance schedule at the start of the year. So for example, I, I put one together for this, for the 2020 season, basically calling out each pond that we'll be performing work on, whether it's in-house or it's contracted out. Um, you know, it goes into detail as far as brush mowing, cutting, clearing trees, dredging, uh, restoring some our um, embankments, um, fixing some outfalls, cleaning. So that would be presented to the Public Works Committee at the beginning of each year so that you're all on board and know what's going on. And then furthermore, after that's um, approved, the, s the city staff would draft a letter and when we're performing maintenance on these ponds, it would be our responsibility to notify those residents that live adjacent to that facility of what's going on, why it's happening, and what the proposed schedule is. Um, we can certainly go maybe outside of just the adjacent residents that, you know, abut the facility, but that's, I mean, that's your call. If you want me to send like a, a certain radius, a quarter mile radius, send letters out, um, up to you 
however you want to. I know like on Pond 5 when I did that, I basically just took, I looked at the GIS map and I basically just highlighted every single parcel that backed up to that facility and that's who I sent letters to. What was the outcome of that? Did anyone? We, we ran into problems with that one because um, there was a multi-tenant building and it was sent to the, the property owner and it didn't funnel down to the actual tenants that occupied the building. Mm -hmm. And so we were in there performing work and everybody's wondering what's going on. Um, but they weren't, they weren't notified, right? It was just the property owner because that was what was out in the GI. That's, you know, so in that situation, you know, we would have to, the staff would have to make certain, and we can write in the procedure that any multi-tenant buildings, each individual suite or office space will receive a letter as well as a property owner. No, I, I think uh, that Aaron is taking a look at that notification procedure mm -hmm. for other for other things yeah. because we're saying well what we're doing really isn't 150 feet or 300 feet is really not adequate for oh yeah for so many of the projects or the that we're talking about so yep. I I check it with him but that's I, I think the point about uh, the multi tenant buildings where the notice goes to the owner but not to the people who are affected mm -hmm. is uh, another in interesting twist to that. And yeah. we mm -hmm. re really should address that, yeah. but that's good. Yep. So your question is, would we like to send to more people than just the people that are directly abutting? Yeah. What are your thoughts, Paul? I, my, my intuition is say, just give it to the folks who are right next to it. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need to, because it's not a major development project. It's a it's a cleaning of their pond and taking some brush out. So yeah. I, I don't think we need to get real large around that area, but that's just my thought. Yeah. I would think in an area like Red Cedar, where we might be working in the ponds, if we were doing it in the ponds in the middle of their area where uh, everybody in the, in the, everybody in the, the uh, facility or the, the area walks around, mm -hmm. I would think we might be we would mm -hmm. feel under notified because there'd be a lot mm -hmm. of people wondering what the heck was going on I, I, in, the, in mm -hmm. that case so other, others are very clear i know, think i would sorry where we need to i think we need to look at making sure that we're getting broad enough notification mm -hmm. i think i'd leave that to the discretion of the city staff because um, you know the ponds and you know the neighborhoods and i yeah. think just make a judgment call when you're setting out the you yeah. know yeah Maybe have a minimum of the abutting property owners. Yeah, and then I think that's the minimum if it's more, more small or something. Yeah. And if it's something like a development, maybe it goes to more people. That's good. Yeah, yeah I would agree with that. And in the policy, then, um, in the case of a place where that has a homeowner association, the <coughs> leadership of that association should be notified as mm -hmm. well. They can mm -hmm. choose they can. whether or not to send it to their right. mm -hmm. um, association at large. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good. good addition. Okay. Um, and then of course, throughout the summer, you know, we will try to tackle as many of these projects as possible, hopefully getting all of them done. And then staff will come back at the end of the year and just do a uh, update of, you know, what was completed, show some photos, so on and so forth. So keep you up to date of what's going on with pond, with our pond maintenance. And then that'll all be um, inputted into the MS4 permit at the end of every year. So every year we got to report what we're doing uh, in our ponds to the state. Got it. So. When we contract out the um, the dredging, mm -hmm. do they just, uh, do they do like a couple ponds a day or how does that work? Is it, do you know, is it just, is it better just to do like one after, right after the other or something or? Well, to be honest, Hudson really hasn't done any dredging of their ponds. Oh, they, oh we haven't. Yeah, okay. I think <laughs> pond number five, yeah, maybe, but I think they just basically pushed the material back up on the embankments. Okay. Um, so nothing's really been done. Okay. Um, so I'm actually meeting with uh, staff from the city of Woodbury. They have a pretty robust dredging program for their ponds. Right. Um, and getting kind of the logistics and procedures that they use when they do it. Is it in winter, summer, fall, spring? What do they do with the material? How do they check depths? You know, so on and so forth. How do you know how much material to take out? And just kind of get an idea of what they're doing so that we can start to do it here. But like I said, it really hasn't been a practice in the city. And so we have a lot of ponds that need dredging. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. How many ponds do we have? Uh, 84. Okay. Approximately. Yeah. That's. And how often? That's public, public ponds. That's public ponds. Yeah. How often? Over 100 if you combine public and private. Okay. 
And how often do they become overgrown? What's the frequency? I mean, I know they're all different, but... Yep, yep, they're all different. Uh, if it's dry or wet detention, um, you know, <clears throat> let's just say we... we the goal is to, to clear them, right? Mm -hmm. And then to stay on top of the, the brush and, and going there and, and brush mull the embankments and the bottoms of the dry retention once or twice a year. So once we get them cleaned out, the only thing that we should really have to do to them is mull them twice a year and then dredge them every, you know, okay. 10 to 15 years. That's the ultimate goal. Okay. Yep. And Mike, what is, what is where it says clear and cut trees less than three inches, what's the DBH? Uh, diameter at breast height. Diameter at, okay, so three it's high. Yep. If it's less than three inches, we would take that out, is that? So it should be greater than. Okay. Greater than three inches. Okay. I gotta turn my arrow around. <laughs> <laughs> so we're Good taking catch. out the larger, the larger trees because they're gonna lose the branches or whatnot into the... Yep, so... We t we'll, what we want to do is instead of, uh, you need a pretty hefty piece of equipment to brush mow or brush up uh, a three inch diameter tree. Okay. So instead of doing that and leaving all the wood chips in the bottom of the pond, we'd rather just clear cut it and remove the tree completely. I see. Yeah. Okay. And then anything, any little saplings or, you know, stuff like that, we would just go in there with the brush mower and mow them down. Okay. And the last question is, it, so if there's like 84 ponds, you said? Yep. And this does like, I think this does nine of them. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Mm-hmm. So like, on a rotation, is it like a, we would do nine or 10 a year or something? We would cover, Depending so after 10 years, we would kind of have done yeah. all of the ponds, basically? Yep, that's the goal. Okay. Yep. And of course, I mean, for this year, basically, the ones that we selected were ones that, I've received calls on mm -hmm. from adjacent residents noticing that they're retaining more water and actually the water is kind of going up into some yards. Okay. Uh, so those are, are on this list and then ones that are located in like parks and stuff where it's just easy for us to go in there and yeah. just go take care of them and not have to deal with a lot of the communications on the front end and just get them off the list. So, um, but yeah, I mean, our ponds range in size from, I mean, our big one, Pond 5 by the post office, that's over five acres in size. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a couple other that are similar size, mm -hmm. and then you know they range to just your average, you know, couple thousand square feet. So it really varies. So I mean, we may be able to tackle ten to twelve a year, depending on the year. The other years, if we're tackling a couple big ones, it'll be a little less. But kind of around that ten is the average that we'll probably shoot for. Sure. Yep. Sounds good. Any other questions or concerns? <clears throat> nice job, by yeah. the way. And it's nice that we're going to get this on a rotation and and keep it up yep. so i'd move to approve the pond maintenance procedure i would second moved and seconded to approve the pond maintenance procedures is there any other discussion all in favor say aye. 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 aye motion carries thank you mike <laughs> this one has been a thorn for <laughs> more than a few years mm -hmm. so getting the procedures yeah. is the first step and and act ready having an action plan yeah so this will be welcome yeah absolutely review and discussion of the intersection of carmichael and hanley road on yeah so this you know this intersection was part of the carmichael road corridor study mm -hmm. and uh council member morris said had recommended that the Public Works Committee look at this intersection uh, and what can be done to improve some of the traffic flow patterns, so on and so forth. Um, and so that's why it's on here tonight. The, in the Carmichael Corridor study, uh, what, was, what was recommended at this intersection was to uh, update the traffic signals to basically have passive left-hand turning movements, which means you, know, you have your green arrow and then a flashing yellow arrow, um, which it currently doesn't have. Uh, if you look in your packet, if you're going southbound, one of the photos is heading southbound. There's a little sign on the end of the median. It says left, left turn, yield on green. So a person making a left-hand movement, if you're on Carmichael making a left-hand movement on the Hanley in either direction, 
you know, you're supposed to yield on a green while people aren't yielding sometimes and they're, we're having some accident issues at that intersection. So, and the, the recommendation in the study was to have like a flashing yellow that you see on a lot of, a lot of county intersections, um, that one. And then the other photo is on Hanley going in an east-west direction. Right now in both directions, we have actually a designated left-hand turn lane. So to update those traffic signals to have a designated <laughs> left-hand green so it clears that traffic in hopes that it would eliminate a lot of that, um, what do you want to say? Cheating. Cheating or, you know, <laughs> are you coming straight? Are you taking a left type of thing? Let's just get the left-hand traffic out of there and then the straight traffic can just clear and just have a lot less impact. So I don't know, if Dean, if, if you looked at this or not. Uh, or? Well, I haven't looked at this intersection in particular, but just to kind of give some background on flashing yellow arrow, uh, basics, I guess. Um, so flashing yellow arrows are fairly new in the scheme of traffic engineering. Uh, it probably came onto the scene about 10 years ago, something like that. Um, so they're, they're uh, nice because they allow uh, you to switch between um, a protected only phase like like if you had just had red yellow green arrow like minnesota uses them a lot uh, where you or say like uh when you're turning from northbound carmichael road onto the ramp to go to westbound 94 there's a red yellow green arrow they can't turn on red kind of thing um you can switch the flashing yellow arrow signal to do that for some times of the day and then switch it to doing the flashing yellow arrow at other times of the day when there's maybe less traffic and or less pedestrians or you know whatever mm -hmm. whatever you needed to control there's a lot more flexibility um, for that the other benefit of flashing yellow arrows um, so if you look at the, the um, well I guess either of those those uh, diagrams if you if you're coming up to the intersection you see a green ball green means go usually in your mind right and so some people don't if they're turning left, sometimes they associate the green with, hey, I can go, rather than like, hey, I need to proceed after yielding to whoever's coming against me or a pedestrian who's crossing or something like that. So the, the flashing yellow alerts them that, hey, I can't just go here. I need to pay attention to what's going on. And so there's been studies that have been done on flashing yellow arrows versus uh, you have the five signal protected permissive, which is on Carmichael Road right now, or the three ball uh, permissive only signal, which is on what's on Hanley right now. Um, in both cases, uh, the flashing of the arrow significantly helps uh, crash rates um, for that. So I am definitely supportive of the change. Um, uh, for this intersection. Um, I don't know if uh, the corridor study included like costs for... It didn't. Yeah. I imagine that um, the cost for switching to flashing out arrow might be somewhat significant because um, you need a different type of traffic signal cabinet um, and you also may need different mast arms on your signals um, to support more than one traffic signal head. Um, so you could be talking about essentially replacing your signal system at that point in time, which is, you know, six figures. <laughs> so it, it's, it's something that uh, I'd definitely be supportive of doing. We just need to make sure we have budgeted accordingly. So, and I know, and I know in our last CIP cycle, there was money designated to <coughs> improve this intersection and do the flashing yellow arrow. I believe there was only thirty thousand dollars designated towards it, and because it wasn't even close to what we would need there, we used that money to update the control cabinet and the yeah. camera system at Crestview and Carmichael, knowing that we would potentially look at this intersection in the future. So, I guess the reason, or what I'm looking for tonight from the committee, is to basically an approval for staff to uh, obtain uh, cost estimates. Um, for the upgrade of this intersection to passive, um, permissive yellow arrows and to um, include it or look, examine it at upcoming bonding CIP cycle. So 
that's kind of what I'm looking for. And then we can, you know, we can pull the crash data. I know it's it's probably one of the most heavily, if we were to pull all the crash data from the city, it's probably one of the, the heaviest sites where we run into crashes. There's, you know, I run into a lot of fender benders at that intersection, so. Mm -hmm. Especially with the developments going on in the south end of town, you know, Lee property, St. Croix Meadows, it's, it's even gonna get more and more heavily trafficked, mm -hmm. so. So essentially, you're looking for the the backstory in terms of what it what it would cost, and yep. if we could get into a bonding. So it's not like a final approval, but we're get, we're gathering information. Gathering information at yeah. this point. Yep, just directing staff time yep. to investigate and get estimates, cost estimates. Yeah, I would I would make that motion. <coughs> Is there a second? Yes, I would second that. Okay. As far as discussion, I have I guess I have one observation. Is I travel that road a lot. And the southbound people violate the light a lot. Mm -hmm. you, you all, you'll have a green light, and they will still be turning in front of you. Sure. So it's uh, we any, anything we can mm -hmm. do to make it, mm -hmm. it obviously do it because it's a problem. Mm -hmm. It's hard to turn there. So yeah. this this should ease that by mm -hmm. offering more opportunities. So I think it's a it's a really good move. The, the investment that we're going to be making in it. That will be for the long haul. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's because that's what they're recommending in the corridor study. Yeah. So we're getting a jump start on what was already recommended anyway. Yeah. So that expenditure, you know, it's not just a temporary something that we're going to need to go in and change when we make the big changes. The, well, and, the and other, with, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say with St. Croix Meadows, as that gets more housing and more activity, yeah. business activity, yeah. I mean, this is going to be a primary intersection yeah. on on the route to that, so we're going to have to do something. So yeah, yeah. That's right. mm -hmm. The uh, the only concern I have is is whether or not we're allowing for pedestrian and bicycles on this. This is a very bad intersection it as is. it stands, and I don't know what the corridor plan has in mind there. Uh, if we really address that, it's it's uh, it's 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 one of those it's three five six lanes wide mm -hmm. yeah on one side and that's where the pedestrians have to cross yeah. Yeah. so it's a it's a, it's a problem and I don't know we, if we need to consider that in the signals or but so I guess Dean yeah um, take it at least one, take a cursory look at yeah that. exactly um, one positive to the flashing our arrows being put in there is um, it allows um, you to if there's a call on the pedestrian face, so if somebody wants to cross the street, the um, signals can uh, not allow somebody to turn left. It'll essentially be like red, yellow, green f only for people turning left to keep the conflict, you know, the left turn conflict for, for pedestrians. Uh, they can avoid that uh, much more than just the what's out there today. Um, in Minnesota, where I came from, they in, down in Rochester, they actually have a bunch of flashing yellow signals and they uh, had some issues with um, people who were turning left, even at the flashing yellow arrow. They'd yield to the traffic coming against them, but they'd forget to look for the pedestrian crossing. Mm -hmm. um, so they ended up, if, if the push button was called, the signal would be red arrow so that the, the left turning traffic wouldn't conflict with the pedestrian crossing the street. So it's a, an ability to do with the flashing yellow arrow versus what's there right now. Yeah. So. And it only does it when that push button is yep. activated. Mm -hmm. and, and when you, when you uh, look at that, I'm not certain that that was adequately addressed in the corridor plan. No. Yeah. So we need to, yeah. that's mm -hmm. a, a piece that needs to be added into that. It's, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's, a, tough, it's a tough one. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do need something there to improve that. Mm -hmm. There is no, there's only two of the, you can only cross one, one Hanley, or I'm uh, sorry, Carmichael on one corner, yep. and, you, and then you cross Hanley yep, on, on the, the other corner, I believe. Yep. So we need to make sure, and I, they've wanted to make it fours, but I, I, don't, I don't think that's possible. There are no sidewalks or Yeah, on that northeast area, corner, yeah, there's nothing either there. Either side, so it's... So right now we're, I think we're, we've, our th the thinking was that's not going to happen. We're not going to be able to, mm -hmm. to uh, push it that way. It would be very ex difficult. Yeah, and one thing too, if we're going through the effort of 
reconfiguring this whole signal, it could get set up for if we added those movements in very easily. Yeah. Could be could happen if we built a sidewalk along the other side of Carmichael yeah. or Hanley or whatever. And we may be wrong. You may look at this and say, "Well, here's a solution." So we would we would appreciate that <laughs> that right. input. But it looks it's difficult. So mm. okay, it's been moved and seconded that we uh, direct the staff to acquire estimated costs for the recommended improvements of the intersection of Carmichael and Hanley Road, which can be incorporated into future bonding cycle. And I would add, my add would be that we examine the, the pedestrian um, and slash bicycle accommodations for now and in the future. Mm -hmm. That's part of, part of the motion. I would, I would accept that. All right. Mm -hmm. um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item, staff introduction to ADA transition plan. All right, uh, thanks Jim. Um, so uh, the city of Hudson uh, does not currently have an ADA transition plan and I'll go through what exactly that means uh, um, as kind of a background. I'm not bringing a plan to adopt tonight or anything, I just wanna start kind of the introduction as to what, what this is, what it's supposed to be covering and kind of the next steps from here where it's going to go so ADA standing for the Americans with Disabilities Act which is a federal law that was initially passed uh, back in 1990 so it's been on the books for almost three decades now um, effective dates of 1991 um, so it was also revised in 2010 so it's been around for a while it's had some you know, tweaks here and there but uh, it's it, it's been around for a while um, there's uh, five different kind of parts to the ADA law. Um, and in this case, uh, the part that applies to what we're looking at tonight is um, the part that applies to state and local government services. Um, the other sections for what it matters is employment, public accommodations, telecommunications, and other miscellaneous provisions. So it, the ADA law goes way beyond physical things on the ground. It also talks about, you know, that you have to provide accommodations to if somebody's trying to say work for the city of Hudson, we need to if they have a disability, we need to accommodate them being able to like get in the building or you know be able to do their job, you know that kind of thing. So um, or also provide uh, you know braille or you know visual assistance th kind of things if if people need it. So um, so the state and local government services part is what applies to to this um, uh, as a part of that let me sorry real quick here um, there's a number of requirements that um, that we have to meet um, and we being any any local or state government has to follow these things so it's not unique to us by any means that everybody has to do it not a lot of people have done it um, so it's uh, I'll get to why we're doing it now but um, so the city must operate their programs so that uh, programs are accessible and usable by individuals with disabilities. Um, we can't refuse to allow a person with a disability to participate in a service program or activity simply because the person has a disability. We have to make reasonable modifications in policies, practices, and procedures that deny equal access to individuals with disabilities. Um, uh, so uh, there's other things too. We must provide notice of what the requirements are for us under ADA, we have to post that somewhere. We have to identify a person who's in charge of making sure we're following ADA as a city. Um, is that in-house or? Yeah, uh, somebody on, on our staff has to be the ADA person okay. essentially. So if somebody has a grievance, they know who to contact okay. to get that result. So generally it ends up being the engineer or some communications type person. So they're closer to being able to like know how to fix something if <laughs> yeah. whatever's wrong. Um, so uh, as also as a part of this, uh, with the ADA requirements, we have to complete a self-evaluation, which um, conveniently uh, with a sidewalk and um, curb ramp inventory we just completed last year that uh, uh, goes a long, long way to completing our self-evaluation requirements. So 
kudos to everybody for getting that done, even though <laughs> it probably wasn't the the reason why you did it, but <laughs> it works conveniently for our case. Um, we uh, must allow public comments to be incorporated uh, into the uh, process. Um, so I'll talk about maybe what we can do about that later. Um, we must also complete a transition plan, which is what we're introducing tonight. Um, there's the ADA law specifies requirements that need to be met to make a route accessible. So it's not just the federal government says, hey, you need to make this accessible. They also say, here's what is accessible, which is kind of nice to know the exact requirements of, of what they're looking for, but also it's, it's a lot of requirements too. So um, requires new uh, construction of say, a, sidewalk, crosswalk, trail to meet ADA requirements as much as feasible. Obviously, when we're talking about a city that's built on a hill, sometimes it's not feasible, but you have to get as close to, as close to meeting requirements as possible when it's not feasible. Um, the ADA law requires curb ramp upgrades, so curb ramps being where sidewalks meet streets, um, so the slope ramps that allow pedestrians to cross um, the street. Uh, to be brought up to compliance with alterations of the traveled way so they give guidance as to what alterations are it includes projects like mill and overlays on streets full depth reclamations street reconstruction projects um, it uh, doesn't require curb ramp upgrades for maintenance projects and they define that among other things as seal co projects crack fills patching potholes that kind of thing um, so Moving on to what the transition plan uh, has to incorporate, it has to identify physical obstacles in the public entities' facilities that limit the accessibility uh, to individuals with disabilities. So in the case of the sidewalk inventory, we've done a lot of that, you know, things like tripping hazards, uh, slopes that are excessive uh, for people who are in a wheelchair or something like that. Um, uh, obstacles that somebody who's visually impaired wouldn't be able to detect and could create a tripping hazard to them who are, aren't able to detect them. So things like that. Um, the plan has to describe in detail the methods that will be used to make the facilities accessible. So how are we going to get from where we are today to compliant? Um, that we have to specify the schedule for taking the steps necessary to achieve compliance. It doesn't say you have to be compliant within 10 years or something like that. It just says you have to have a schedule as to how you're gonna do this. So it's a little bit open-ended. Um, has the plan has to indicate whoever's responsible for impl implementation of the plan. So for example, me as a city engineer, when I do a street reconstruction project, I'm responsible for making sure ADA is adhered to when we rebuild a sidewalk or a crosswalk or a trail or something. Um, so what it is not is a list of specific projects. Um, it's, it's a general guidance document. It's not, uh, you know, hey, this crosswalk out here is really unsafe, so we're going to do that project next year, that kind of thing. It's more of an overarching general kind of document. And it also doesn't um, talk about like missing links in sidewalk and trail networks. It's only talking about what you have in the ground right now. So, um, or what you may put into the ground in the future, but it's not you know, identifying necessarily that. So the other thing that kind of will dovetail into this is that the city is putting together a bicycle and pedestrian plan which will take care of those kind of things, uh, missing links or safety issues, uh, you know, crossing streets and that kind of thing. So um, what we are covering now uh, are sidewalks, trails, crosswalks within city right-of-way. Um, right now we're not going to cover uh, city property outside of right-of-way. Um, we're hoping that in the future we'll do that, but we wanna start somewhere and get something on the books for uh, purposes I'll explain in a minute, but um, not covering inside city buildings at this point. There'll be, have to be something added later. Um, and, the, and the other uh, list of the five things, the other things on that list we're not covering at this moment. So why now? Um, well, obviously, since the law was passed way back in 1990, we're way overdue for having this. <laughs> it was originally, there was a uh, July of 1992 is when all these agencies were supposed to have a transition plan on the books and 
pretty much nobody did. Mm -hmm. um, and really, I think that goes back to there was nobody enforcing it. There's no teeth behind it. Um, so nobody did it because there's other things that are going on in the city. And so if there's nothing that's going to be enforceable, then we're just going to move on to something else kind of thing. Um, so right now, uh, one of the reasons why we're doing it, um, FHWA finally decided that's the Federal Highway Administration. So federal government um, has decided that they're going to be starting to withhold federal funding from agencies that do not uh, comply or don't have a transition plan in place. Um, I don't know when that magic date is, but it's going to be so I hear sometime soon. So it's uh, really important for us to have this plan in place so we don't miss out on, mm -hmm. on that in the future. Um, we can be sued uh, for not having a plan in place. Um, we can be subject to um, penalties or enforcement actions by the Department of Justice without a plan in place. If you go on the ADA.gov website, they post all their judgments and uh, you know, all that stuff on the website kind of as, uh, hey, you need to make sure you have a plan in place because all these people didn't and look what happened, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, and they'll make you do things you don't want to do if you don't uh, get your ducks in a row. So, so we feel that we should get our ducks in a row before we have any problems with that. Um, so next steps, um, uh, it would be a future city council action to introduce the plan. So I'd, I come to city council to introduce it to the whole council and say, a, a similar type spiel to what I just said, Oops, excuse me, um, and authorize a public hearing to, for the transition plan so that there's a formal opportunity for the public to weigh in on the things that we'll be talking about in the transition plan. Then hold the public hearing and incorporate any comments that we get into the, into the plan development itself. Um, city will draft the plan internally, so we're not gonna have somebody else go and do it because we feel we were able to do it. I actually made the transition plan on the community I was in, so I feel very comfortable in doing it. Um, then we'll come back to the Public Works Committee for review, um, and then, depending on how that goes, uh, forward it to City Council and hopefully adopt it this year. So, um, so I don't need any action tonight. I just was wondering if you guys had any thoughts concerns, questions about this process, any, anything that we should you know, think about as we're starting this process? Um, could you go I have been thinking about this. And Mary, would you step up to the microphone? <laughs> Mary Ann Weber, 604 Grandview Drive, quickly falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but, Sorry, I hope uh, I wasn't putting you to sleep. <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it's late in the afternoon and I haven't eaten. But um, I was thinking about this, this subject, and I was thinking that getting together a committee of, of people who, who um, have disabilities, mm -hmm. like someone from Caring Bridge, and we have a neighbor who's disabled, and bringing them into the conversation, because they'll randomly say something. Okay. Like if you run into them on a street corner or something, uh, and they'll start talking to you about their issues, and, mm -hmm. and our neighbor will mention issues that he has with being downtown. Uh, I was wondering if that might be an approach to uh, coming up with a plan. Certainly, yeah. That's it. Yep. Um, Is it beneficial to create a draft of the plan and then give it to a committee for review, or have people comment prior to doing the draft? Um, what do you do in... Yeah, uh, in Red Wing, what we did is we actually had an online survey that people could go to, and we advertised the heck out of it to get people to, you know, okay. yeah, but you prioritize things uh, that they wanted to see and whatnot. Um, so um, that's one way you could do it. Um, another, way, like like Marion said, a lot of communities actually do. do I like that, that idea. Um, yeah. I like that idea. If uh, I'm you guys as elected officials may know of uh, more people who are in kind of those uh, communities, uh, maybe visually impaired people, uh, deaf people, uh, elderly people, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, and it doesn't have to be a standing committee, it could be just uh, once or twice. Yeah, once or know, twice kind of thing. Yep, just exactly. to get their input and what, what struggles they face in the city and give you a yep. better idea of what, mm -hmm. how to, mold yep. the plan to, to meet. Yeah, and 
I've also, um, since we're going through getting information for the bicycle and pedestrian plan, I was kind of using some of that commentary to uh, whatever was applicable to the transition plan to use that as well. So, um, so there's a little bit of Overland. two birds with one stone, which is nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, I agree with Marion that uh, having having a specific engagement uh, is is probably a good idea. I just would need your connections and expertise yeah. and who that would be <laughs> or how to get a hold of them. Is, so is that are you guys up to that? Uh, yeah, I I would think provide well, input to to Dean as to uh, people or, or organizations that may have some be worth connecting with. Sure. Yep. I would also ask though, <clears throat> are you thinking for the timing of that kind of input? Right now you're just working on writing the transition plan, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I have a sense, and I think I heard you say during your explanation that what a plan is not is specifics like the intersection at Walnut and First and mm -hmm. the intersection at Locust and mm -hmm. whatever. Um, so we're not to, in the plan, it doesn't itemize, like this is a problem area, this is a problem area, this is a problem area. Mm -hmm. I think when we get that public input, which I do, I support every single time we reach out to the public for input. Um, and, and I think in this case, it's super critical mm -hmm. that we do that. But I have a feeling what we're going to get from them is, in my neck of the woods, I want to cross this street and I can't. Mm -hmm. And so we're, so we're going to get a laundry list of all the places that we mm -hmm. have problems. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure the timing of that public input, if it's needed just yet, mm -hmm. or if we want the plan first, at least drafted, um, before seeking sure that I, I, yep. you know what i'm saying it, the plan sounds as i understand it more organizational yep. like who's going to be the point person mm -hmm. for this who's gonna hey it sounds more organizational but i think once we have that then i think we do go to absolutely these, almost i think of them as almost like focus groups mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. set up a focus group at the retirement home or you know what i mean set up set up some of the um areas where we could get some more of the specifics that because i think when push comes to shove, we're going to also need the specifics, right? Because we're going to uh, want to know oh, where yeah. to start. Yeah. So. Yes. And the specifics would be helpful, too, to put in, like, the bike ped plan yeah. for implementation in the future for specific things as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. okay. the other, I love yeah. the fact that you have experience writing a previous mm -hmm. plan for Red Wing. Yeah. Uh, very nice. Um, Thanks. Um, <laughs> the other question I have is, um, how does this relate to the comp plan? Because there's... Would would this be then incorporated under into the comp plan somehow, or? I would foresee it. We'll talk to Mike Johnson, but under the transportation portion of the comp plan, I think mm -hmm. we would try to incorporate that into it. Mm -hmm. At least a reference to that as well. Mm -hmm. A reference yeah. to that yeah. document or that it plan. becomes part of it. Yep. 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 I think it'd be good for future future guidance for yeah. the city. So get that documented. If that's a critical. Yep. Item. Good. Good mm -hmm. question. I think you've got our uh, mm -hmm. our input and yeah. uh, thank you for, for the comments. Me. Yeah. Discussion of possible action on request for no parking signage on Heritage Boulevard. All right, another forwarded item from the Public Safety Committee. Um, they they received a uh, email from a resident out there uh, about the no parking on Heritage Boulevard. Um, currently, the Heritage Boulevard ranges in width from 24 to 27 feet. So on a typical street width that's that wide, there usually is no parking on one side of the street or the other, just because if you have parking on both sides and two cars meet, you, there's no possible way for them to pass. So within the development itself, actually all the other streets are signed on one side or the other, no parking. And it's just for some reason Heritage Boulevard is not the full width. Uh, Dean and I did go out there and look at uh, what's currently out there. And if you go to the far north end of the development, Friendship Green is kind of the circle on the north end of the development where the start of the yellow line is. Mm -hmm. From For the first kind of quarter of a mile, or I wouldn't say quarter of a mile, that's probably the whole stretch. For the first <laughs> couple hundred yards, it actually is no parking on the west side of Heritage Boulevard. And then all of a sudden you get to Kinsman and it stops. So... To be consistent, 
uh, staff is recommending that we just continue the null parking signage on the west side of Heritage Boulevard all the way down to Linden at this point in time. And we uh, took a look at, uh, you know, how many driveways are on either side of the street and fire hydrants and, you know, things that would cause, you know, should we do it on one side or the other? And it was pretty even, evenly split. Like, you know, there's you know, one section, there's more driveways on one side of the street and another section that's on the other side of the street. And there's a hydrant on this side and then a hydrant on that side. So it's kind of, it's not really a clear... Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, right or wrong answer, so to speak, to this case. So we felt that just continuing it on the west side where it already is for that first block or two uh, mm -hmm. made a lot of sense. So My question would just be, um, were there, when you went out there, were there many cars parked there or is there, is there adequate parking for the folks that live in that neighborhood? So where we run into a lot of parking is towards the north end where the signs currently are. Um, for, so we're the top of the yellow. Yeah. So, if, like I said, the first two blocks where it is signed, we will have a lot of cars parked on the side street there just because uh, there's some row homes and just the types of homes that are there. People will tend to park out there. As you go further west on Heritage Boulevard, we don't run into that very often. Mm -hmm. And the reason I know that is because when my plow driver is out there and he can't get through, that's always the spot is on the top. Side. On the top. Yeah. But that's already marked as no parking, you're saying? Mm -hmm. Are they parking in no parking zone or are they just outside of it? I think they're well, just probably just outside of outside where it's of it. signed right Where now. it stops, yeah. basically. And when we were out there, there weren't a lot of people parked out there. We were, but we were kind three of three in the four. middle of the day, so yeah. it might not have been truly representative of, say, yeah. when people are coming home and parking on the you know, street after work kind of thing. Yeah. So. so I guess my question is then, if we put the signs up, do we know that those folks have a place to park? You know, do they, I don't know this neighborhood real well, so yeah. where do they, where would they go basically? So, you know, if we put no parking on the west side, I mean, they can still all park on the east side of Heritage Boulevard. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they would still be allowed to park on street, just won't be on both sides. I see It'll just be reduced to one side. So they would just maybe go down a little further or something like yeah. that mm -hmm. then. Okay. Well, in, in general, the, the residents, if it's a, a single family home, there's they have their they have, they have two car garages and, and drive, drive yeah. sufficient driveway to yeah. park all vehicles. It just may not be as convenient. Right. So and just from a just from a, a practical road standpoint, road construction standpoint, when we have these narrow streets, like I said in the beginning, one side or the other is, is most always commonly signed no parking just because there isn't adequate room to have parking on both sides and to have two cars meet. So even, let's just say, you know, we go through, we get this approved, we put the, the signs up on the west side, and we get a couple phone calls about why did you do that? Well, the simple answer is the road width dictates that this signage go up, and it's actually currently in the remaining part of the development. Everything else is signed. Every, everything else is signed. Everything else is signed. No parking on one side or the other. So well, you want to make sure your snow plows can get through yeah, for exactly. making sure the roads are clear, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> I, I think the need is obviously there, the, the uh, probably the... The big question is notification of the mm -hmm. affected neighbors and, and perhaps the HOA and the, uh, is this Bill Alms? Yes. District? Yep. yep. And he's on, no, he's not on public safety. Yeah, he's on he, public he's safety. He's on public safety, so he knows yeah. about it. Okay. But maybe prior to installation, a letter drafted from the city to the HOA at the very least to let them know right. what's going on. So if they get phone calls, they know why. Mm -hmm. Would be warranted. We can do that. It, I mean, the sign, we're not going to be installing the signs until the springtime anyways right. when okay. yeah. things go away and the ground thaws. So. And the notices would go out first. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense, yeah. Yep. I would move that we direct staff to install no parking signage on Heritage Boulevard on the western side of the street. I'm going to second that. It's been moved and seconded. I would note that this is not the first time that we've done something like this. There's been other instances where streets are narrow and they park on both sides and it becomes a, a roadblock. So uh, it's a safety issue, un unquestionably. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Review public works meeting dates. 
there any any questions on on those dates I think most of you I, I've heard that most everybody's responded that these dates work I know the only one that doesn't work for me is July 13th um, I'll be leading our church mission trip again we always do one in July so um, I quite possibly will miss the November meeting but the rest of them appear yeah, and I will I will miss the April meeting so okay I may miss the October meeting as well so we could have a quorum at all all of these it sounds like it looks good we tried to put them at a consistent uh, yeah day of the month or whatever the Monday following the first council meeting so yeah, I was gonna say, Jim. I really appreciate that having them scheduled out, and on that Monday, I think that's that just really helps my schedule. So appreciate that. Yeah, good, good. Now we can, you know, we, if things come up, we can move them around. But now we're we have a basic schedule that we can all try to mm -hmm. to fit fit around. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you can appreciate I add that. Add it to the city calendar. <laughs> oh, on the city calendar even. On the city Whoa. <laughs> That was presumptuous. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, we have four minutes for project Four minutes for project <laughs> updates. Oh, sorry, I'll make it quick. Um, so currently in the process of uh, drafting the Safe Routes to School application. They're due tomorrow. Um, just got to put on finishing touches tomorrow for submission. Um, Dean and I were talking today. Uh, we will be bringing forth uh, preliminary resolutions for the 2020 Street reconstruct or not? Not Mill reconstruct. Overlay. Mill and overlay project. Uh, reconstruct. Um, as well as preliminary resolutions for curb replacement and the sidewalk replacement program uh, for the upcoming summer as well. So um, those are all going to be accessible projects uh, when you're dealing with sidewalks, curbs, and so aprons type of thing. So we'll be coming straight to council with those to expedite the process. Uh, going through the steps, drafting the report, so on and so forth, emailing or mailing them out to the affected property owners, so on and so forth. So we just kind of, like I said, talked about that today, so that'll be rolling here. It's the project season. We are looking at the paper today, and a lot of communities are starting to bid out some of their street maintenance programs. <laughs> like, oh, we need to get on this. <laughs> so um, that'll be full, full force ahead here in February. So other than that, um, I can't think of anything outside. I mean, the guys have been doing a great job plowing, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the – the few snowstorms that we've had. I know we had a lot of residents concerned with the, the snow downtown last week. Um, and kind of what I've been telling people is, you know, it was, it was one of those things where the snow events align where we had three, three of them in one week. Typically when that happens, I'm gonna wait till the last one is done. Um, we did get a lot of kickback about that. And Jim and I have since kind of talked about maybe coming up with some outside the box uh, ways of removing the snow earlier, whether that's through contracting, so on and so forth. Um, but that'll be a need as we uh, move forward here. Um, other than that, doing good, doing good, so. Doing good. Any items for future agendas? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion. I'll move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.